You will not recheck our scores? Fine, have fun with unemployment. Posted by Peach G Fuel. For context, I've been working in this health insurance company for the past uh, three years, and I recently took another position with better hours and better pay. But this time, it was to coordinate appointments with doctors and specialists. My metrics were always great, and the reason I was selected for the new position was due to my metrics. This had been brewing since October of 2022. We used to have a coworker, let's call her Karen. Karen is this old lady that thinks she knows it all and everything she says is right, and she often blames everything on someone else. Typical Karen activities. The first time I interacted with her was back in October when I messaged her via our work chat because she messed up prior authorization for a patient and the MD office was calling to have the person that created the authorization fix the issue. The conversation went like this. I said, hi, good morning. I have an MD office calling requesting to speak to you in regards to a prior authorization that looks incomplete. Karen says, and you can help them? This is a call center, you're supposed to help, and I don't even know who that MD is. You're correct, this is a call center. However, you created the authorization, and as you know, I cannot fix authorizations that weren't created by me. And also, they would like to speak with you specifically. I also provided her the patient record number and the MD office phone number. Well, I'm not available to talk to them. Okay. I went back to the call and I specifically told the MD what she said, including the she's not available to talk, but hopefully she will call them back to fix the issue. I also sent a message to my direct supervisor with a screenshot of our conversation and I simply said, this is unprofessional, especially in an environment like ours. Fast forward the start of the year and Karen took a position with our quality assurance department due to them being understaffed. I used to work in the QA department and I knew the ins and the outs and I knew that she would be assigned to our department since she already had the experience. So for context, our quality assurance gives us scores from 100 and if we miss something, we get points deducted. So for example, you miss HIPAA, it's minus 20. You give inaccurate info, minus 10. If you don't advise people for our survey, minus five and, and so on. So in January comes my first bad score in three years in the company. It was a 56%. And I was astonished because it's the first time that I've had a bad score. But I also make sure that this score is correct and our company gives us a choice to listen to our calls just to be sure, just in case the quality agent made a mistake. I listened to my call and, well, I did everything right. I completed the information, I provided good service, and I asked if the patient needed assistance with anything else and provided the closing script. On the quality note, it was stated that I didn't offer any help and that I didn't even complete HIPAA. I sent it to my supervisor and he stated that when I offered the closing script, the patient asked something and I replied and disconnected the call. Okay. I still said the closing script and his question and my answer literally lasted 5 seconds. My supervisor still went to her and managed to fix the score to a 95% because she felt like I didn't provide a survey. If someone's worked in a call center, you know that the metrics are everything and one bad thing will quickly not get your monthly bonuses and on top of that, we get our butts handed to us by management because if we don't achieve the metrics, they also don't get bonuses. So I took screenshots of our conversation and I saved it in a file and then I sent it to my personal email since I know our IT department is known for deleting anything that's not a working system or appropriate. So fast forward three days ago or April 18th. I had received several scores ranging from 85% to 80% and only one 100% score. The 100 score, I received it because Karen wasn't the one who audited my call and the other person found everything all right. But the 85% looked fishy since the first thing you see is the patient name and I quickly remembered the call because the person was funny and I enjoyed the call. I listened to the call and of course I did everything perfectly. However, Karen put on the system that she deducted 10 points for not telling the patient that he had a copay for the visit and another 5 points for extending the call. What? I contacted my supervisor and let him know of what happened, however I didn't receive a response. I was confused, so I sent a message to a coworker who had told that they had been having the same issue with Karen with the inaccurate audits and the department is not achieving their monthly goals due to it. Since my supervisor didn't reply, I did what everyone does when management doesn't reply. Well, I messaged Karen, and I sent her a message that just said, Hey, I have seen some inaccurate audits, and I would like to know if you could recheck them since I listened to the calls and everything was done properly. The reply I received was, All audit scores are final and cannot be appealed. 
I knew it was a lie since I worked with quality before and I know it could be changed. I replied, hey, you know, I worked in that department for one year and I know it could be rechecked and reversed, right? Karen said, your previous position is irrelevant in this matter. If you don't like the score, you can go ahead and submit a complaint to my supervisor. I replied, okay, have a good day, knowing that her supervisor knows me really well. Q malicious compliance. I just didn't create one formal complaint. I created one complaint for each time that she scored me incorrectly. Not only that, but I also told my 19 coworkers what she said and advised them that if they would like their scores overturned and rechecked, they could send a complaint to her supervisor, but only send one complaint per bad score. And also to let you guys know, we don't get one audit a month. <laughs> no, no, no. We get audited 10 times per month. In the span of 24 hours, her supervisor must have received around 200 complaints from our department, complaining for one person, Karen. The first complaint was mine with Karen's conversation, saying that all decisions are final and she cannot recheck or overturn, and also saying to submit a complaint to her supervisor. Her supervisor sent me a message saying that they will evaluate all the complaints and scores and we will be receiving a message. That was on Monday, April 17th. Tuesday, we didn't get any messages. Wednesday, I couldn't go to work due to my illness. But today, on April the 20th, I received a message from her supervisor stating that my scores have been reviewed and properly scored, and also stating that my supervisor will be under investigation because any complaint should be submitted to his manager and he never submitted anything, and that the employee has been terminated. <laughs> But the best part is logging into our chat and seeing Karen's profile with no pictures and instead of her name, it only said unknown user. The morale of our group is better and I hope we don't have issues again. Oh man, this is just awesome because you think it's just gonna be nice little MC, right? You get the job done type stuff. But then you find out, oh, we are going in as a group together, 20 people strong. Oh, we have all complaints against this Karen who gets into the position that I, or OP, was in thinking she knows it all, but then I have some back issues there and I know more. Well then, that's 200 complaints to go to the supervisor and just completely obliterate Karen. So I'm thinking supervisor's gonna, you know, poor guy's gonna be a bystander to this here. Turns out he's messed up too and doesn't send the stuff to his manager. So everybody, like, like the castle has now crumbled and fallen down on all of these. It's not, it's, it's like the piggies with the straw house and the stick house. That is what they're constructed of. This was an amazing job for OP to tear this whole thing down, destroy this operation, and get justice. This story is completely wild, and I had a lot of fun with the voices for it, so <laughs> I hope you enjoy. Do your job. Okay, Karen. Posted by Not the Golden Child 616. So I work in online fulfillment at a large home, garden, and building supply store. Mysterious. My job title comes into play later as technically we aren't supposed to work with customers directly, just point them in the right direction or find another associate who works in that department. I had a massive order to grab, several heavy and large pieces of sheet metal and screws. Problem is, the sheet metal size I need isn't where it's meant to be, so I'm having to scan pretty much, well, everything to figure out what's what. Bigger problem? This lingering in the wild, sadly, put me at a range of a wild Karen attack. Wild Karen in a raging harpy voice says, are you gonna help me or not? I'm suddenly very confused looking at her, especially as she hasn't spoken to me at all. She says increasingly annoyed, well, I've been standing over there forever and you haven't offered to help me. I say, uh, my bad, I can try? I don't work in this department, so it depends if... Suddenly, actively hostile, Karen says, Try? Ugh, no, you will. It doesn't matter if you work in this department or not. I'm taking calming breaths so I don't lash back, wondering what this woman's problem is. Uh, okay, what do you need? Definitely unable to control annoyance in my tone as this woman is yelling at me. This! I'm not joking when I say she proceeds to suddenly pull out a screw and nearly stab me in the eye, shoving it towards me. 
I push her hand away, feeling much less calm as I have PTSD reactions to people putting hands in my face, much less of a freaking screw. Now I'm visibly shaking. Okay, ma'am, screws are at the end of the aisle on the left. What? I already know that. I'm angrily replying, oh, okay, what size is that? What size do you need? Even angrier, Karen replies, you tell me. She takes a step closer as if she's trying to seem threatening. I'm unable to hold back and say, I have no clue, ma'am. There is an entire wall of screws. It's impossible for me to tell its size just by looking at it. You will not come at me like that. She says me like she's some royal and I should feel afraid. Your manager would not like that. I no longer give two craps, and I say, you think? Well, I could get a manager if you'd like. Maybe one of them can identify the screw by sight. Don't make me mad today. Just do your job. Cue what could count as malicious compliance. I realized that I'd already told her exactly where that product is that she needed and where it would be located. Yes, ma'am. I walked away from her to my trolley and proceeded to continue looking for the items on my order. What are you doing? doing my job. What was funny was, an aisle over, one of our assistant managers actually was nearby. With Karen ranting and stomping like a toddler, I walked over when I noticed him and told him that I had two issues. One, can't find the item, and two, I got a Karen that he may want to talk to. He laughed and showed me where the correct size sheet metal improperly was and totally ignored her, same as I was, until she huffed loudly and stormed away. I don't think she liked that my manager did like how I handled the situation. Okay, look, is it just me or is this Karen like next level Karen? Because you know she's coming at you angry, right? And you're like, oh, not this again. And then she pulls out a screw, threateningly act like she's gonna stab you with a piece of metal. You don't know where that's been. You don't know where she's got it from. Is it rusted? Are you gonna get stabbed? Have to go to the hospital? What about a tetanus shot? There's so much stuff here and being that she's a Karen, you don't have any idea. It's mysterious, right? Just like the position was at the start of this title. It's all mysterious. It's a grab bag. You reach in, you don't know what you're going to get. You might get a nice piece of candy, or you might get bitten by a snake. Karen is the snake in, in this example here, as you probably know. OP, good job holding your cool as, as well as you did. I know it was tough, but holy crap, you had a day, man. You had a freaking day. OP nailed it. Karen got screwed. Hammer down, OP, and drill that MC in. How about some dad joke humor for this one? The Karen of my building told me her keycard isn't working, demanded that I fix her keycard. So I did. Posted by I'm the one who. This just happened like maybe five minutes ago and I think it's hilarious. I'm the facility manager for my building. Everything that happens and goes wrong is my responsibility. So I make sure that everything runs smoothly. My boss has made it clear. It's my building and I was hired to not only keep people in line, but run everything. I'm not a jerk, but I do hold people accountable forcibly but politely. There was no facility manager for a long time before I came along and both clients and employees ran amok with no order. In the four months that I've been here, my boss has praised my performance and has gone to bat for me countless times. She is the best boss that I have ever had. I've got a firm but fair approach and my reputation reflects that. So I've got a Karen in the building, <laughs> and trust me, the name stereotype applies, who's just a counselor for family services, has nothing to do with our group. She likes to complain about well, everything and gives my boss a headache almost daily. She shares an office with another woman who, unfortunately, picks up on her Karen tendencies. She's like a Karen in training. I've been doing a keycard audit all week, and I knew to leave Karen's keycard alone because she's the only Karen in the building, so her name stands out. I am missing 75 keycards, lots of former employees having all door access, dating all the way back to 2015. You can't have that, so I deleted a lot of them, especially if it'd be like a wacky name or just like a room number or something. However, I did delete Kit's card information, Karen in training, because it wasn't under her name. She just came to tell me her keycard wasn't working and Karen happened to be passing by and overheard it. I went and fixed Kit's keycard and we went to go check to see if it worked or not. We found Karen outside the office waiting, complaining to my boss that her keycard didn't work either. Karen wandered away and my boss rolled her eyes and I smiled and I told her that I would take care of it. 
After checking to make sure Kit's keycard worked, I went downstairs to check the system, looked up Karen, and hey, wouldn't you know it, her keycard was completely fine. In fact, it showed that she had a master keycard. So I changed all of her permissions and I limited her back to just her room only. So I went upstairs and I got my boss's attention because her office is next door to the ladies and I mouthed, listen, and pointed. I opened their door and was all, hey Karen, I went and checked your key card in the system. Everything is good to go. In fact, <laughs> it said you had a master key to the building and well, per the company orders, so since you're not a contractor or a company employee, I can't give you that access. So I had to revoke your status to just this room only. Can't have you bugging people on official business, <laughs> as I winked. Thanks for bringing your key card to my attention. She started to object that she needed that master key card because X, Y, Z, and I was all, yeah, sorry, maybe before, but I'm the facility manager and you don't need access to everything except this office. And hey, if you do, it's outside your pay grade, so you'll have to come get me, okay? Cool, thanks, bye. And then I just closed the door on her mid-sentence. My boss was quietly laughing her butt off in her office and gave me an air high five. <laughs> this is funny, right? Because she's all thinking that, oh, I, I'm going to say my key card's not working, blah, blah, blah. And it turns out it's actually working and she's just being a Karen. And, and then he checks it out, right? And, and it turns out she's got a master key. She can go everywhere and she's not supposed to go everywhere anymore. <laughs> so does a little MC, right? On the key card, revokes everything, breaks the news to Karen in a totally sarcastic, sly, sneaky, and nice little way, just as a response to a Karen, right? And then boom. Nails that MC. Karen got what was coming to her. In a funny way. She had the keys to the kingdom and you snatched them right up from her. Nice job, man. You've decided to fire me because I was in the hospital? Miss your wedding dinner tasting then? Posted by Lika Y. This happened when I just graduated university. I had my main job over the weekend, which paid the living and a side job at a large mobile phone and broadband selling company, basically retail, but with phones. The shop was located inside a larger retail store as an island in the middle, and of course, a lot of people didn't know about it, and didn't exactly visit our store to buy a contract or an upgrade. Instead, they would go to the store on the high street, which was a lot nicer and bigger compared to our island. A few important details about the store. The working times are usually 9 to 200 hours on the weekdays. Tills have to be shut at 8pm, otherwise it causes issues with accounting. Staff members, unless they're warehouse, cannot stay past 8.10 or 8.15 due to insurance reasons and only the managers can lock the store up. Warehouse can stay later and they have their own exit, however it can't be used by those who are not working in the warehouse. When you start and finish, you have to put the times in a special machine which compares them to your rota, same when you go to lunch. If you finish earlier than you're scheduled, then the machine will automatically put it as unauthorized absence. The other option is putting it as sick. You cannot take holiday on the day and the times of the road it cannot be changed on the day either. So you can't put someone as starting at 9 and change the same day as the starting at 10 as it wouldn't allow you to. If you forgot to clock out, the extra time will be counted as overtime and only the manager can amend it, but they cannot make it that you worked less than what's on the road. However, it's also a lot easier to amend the times on the same day, as if you're trying to do it the next day, you'll need the details of the member of staff to do it, like their memorable word and so on. Also in our island store, you must have at least two employers working during the same hours as per company policy. It was my last day at said store. My manager decided to let me go because I didn't attend a shift due to being in the hospital and I was still on my probation. I was told that I still have to work the notice period, which was two weeks. My manager, I'll call him Dan, had to create rotas two weeks in advance as per company policy. He can change the rotas up to last Friday of the week, meaning that he can change next week's rota on the Friday before, but not after. So Dan scheduled me on my last day on a 1700 to 2100 hour shift when my usual shifts are 16 to 20. I have asked him if this was correct both personally and in the team group chat and he confirmed it. Dan was also the type of those whiny managers who don't do anything but complain about everything and they don't bother to train you or show you the ropes. So I kinda knew he made a mistake but decided not to mention it. Cue malicious compliance. 
Friday rolls on and I'm hungry, so I decided to have a late lunch before my shift starts. I'm putting the order through and notice Dan is trying to call me. I decline. I finish my order to feel that Dan is trying to call me again alongside with a few texts received from him. I decide to reply. Dan says, Hey, where are you? You are not at the store and it's already past four and we have one of the higher ups checking how things are going. Oh, oh, I'm having lunch, I say. I'm not scheduled till 5 p.m., remember? Well, no, you are lying. Your shifts are always four till eight. I make sure of it. Get here. I can't stay as I have to try the food that will be served at my wedding and compose the menu. Oh, sorry, but, but I really can't. I have just ordered lunch and I'm waiting for it to be ready and then I have to eat. I've asked you if the road is correct and you said it is, but in case if you don't believe me, I'll send you a screenshot and I'll see you at five. I did send him a screenshot where I've questioned my times and he confirmed that they are correct. I haven't heard from him till I got back to the store. At the store, I see Dan talking to the higher up person. Dan notices me first, waves me over as soon as I sign in, and says he really needs to be somewhere else. He just needs to get to his office and get his coat. I nod and have a small talk with the higher up. Higher up says, Oh, it was so nice of Dan to cover the start of your shift as you were having a family emergency. He's such a good and caring manager. Family emergency? Not sure what you're on about, but my shift has just started as per Rhoda. The higher up is confused. He asks to see the Rhoda, so I gladly show him the pictures Dan has posted on the group chat. Then higher up turns to me and another member of staff and asks if one of us is a team leader, and if not, when did we start? After finding out we're not team leaders and have started less than 12 weeks ago, the higher up gets visibly angry. He stops Dan as he was on his way to leave and tells him he cannot leave the premises as it is against the company's policy to leave employees who haven't been with the company for 12 weeks unattended or to close up, so he must stay. Otherwise, the company insurance is not valid and there will be a hefty fine. Dan has no option but to stay, meaning he was missing the food tasting. He wanted to call his fiance, however, the higher up has reminded him no phones during the shift and while on the store floor so Dan couldn't even let him know who was texting him non-stop. While Higher Up was there and while Dan was forced to do his job, I had a few more conversations with him and brought up all the things Dan failed to provide us for training on and alongside with the lack of support in any progression meetings, so by 8 o'clock, Higher Up was ticked with Dan and was organizing a meeting with him and extra training for him which I don't think was paid as Dan had to do it outside of work hours. He was also put on a close monitor for at least a month. As everyone was leaving at 8pm, I was slowly getting ready. Dan had tried to hurry me up, but I was mainly ignoring him. The store needs to be closed before 8.10, hurry up! Oh, but you scheduled me till 9pm today, I can't leave before that as the system won't allow me to clock out. Well you must leave as insurance does not cover us against theft or damage if there's someone else in the store after 8pm. We have to put the alarms on too. Sorry, but I, I really don't want to miss out on any money. You schedule me till 9, so I'll work till 9. What are you going to do? You need to leave. I can clean the display models and the island does look like it needs to be vacuumed. The higher up was having the best time in the world. He was still there enjoying the show since he saw that Dan put me till 9pm. At some point, he gets tired of our back and forth and told Dan to cover me till 9pm and stay in the store and then change the hours in the system that I finished at 9 and I can go home. Dan has tried to argue, but the higher up has pointed out that it was his mistake and if something happens in the store, he will be the one responsible as he should have checked the rotas beforehand. Dan has no choice but to follow the orders. From what I've heard, he left around 10 p.m. that day as the system wouldn't allow him to log in. His fiance also left him a few years later. I don't know the reason why, but she took the house and the dog and saved money since she never married him. I've heard that Dan works as a personal growth coach, but he's not very successful at it either. Dang, Daniel, I mean, this guy, he had this idea in his system, he's gonna trick the whole system, right? But no. OP actually knows the rules, knows what to do, brings that up to a higher up who was definitely going to come down on Dan, and then just backfires completely on Dan. This right here, as I say, textbook malicious compliance. 
OP knows the letter, knows the spirit, and they act accordingly properly, covering their butt and nailing their boss. Way to go, OP. Can't remove the charge? Well, I'll just use it then, posted by egranto 3 In the early 2000s, when I first moved out on my own, I rented from a complex that charged you for assigned parking. It was an upcharge of $25 a month. If you didn't get assigned parking, you would have to fight for a space on the street. My apartment was in the back of the complex, and I was getting over a recent knee and ankle injury, so I opted for paid parking that was relatively close to my front door. My car was a junker, three years older than I am, but it ran semi-okay, and the heater worked. As a newly minted adult, well, I was happy to have it. About three months into my lease, my car went to the great scrap heap in the sky. I had gotten used to the local transit system and discovered a nearby store would drop off groceries for me. This was long before Walmart and other stores started doing it, so it was cheaper than figuring out a month's supply on the bus. So I opted not to replace my car and utilize the bus pass that my work reimbursed me for. I went to my leasing office and told them that I no longer needed the space and would you please remove the extra charge from my bill. The manager at the desk was new and had never been asked that before. She promised to look into it and let me know. I was naive and I figured it would be gone come next month. Nope, it was still there. I paid all but the parking space and called up the complex. Same girl. She said she was awaiting word from higher ups and offered me a credit for the charge as a one-time courtesy. I reminded her that I no longer owned a car. I hadn't just changed my mind. I told her that the space had been empty for close to a month now and that I won't be utilizing it. She said she understood, loud and clear, and would get it sorted by next month. Three days before rent was due, she finally got back to me. Apparently, it was in my lease and couldn't be removed without breaking the lease and signing a new one. Even if I didn't move out, the lease breaking and initiation fees would be charged to me and my rent would go up to the new current market value. This would be over a thousand dollars, so it's not an option for someone freshly on their own. I kept the parking space on the lease. Three weeks later, I was reviewing my lease to get the phone number for maintenance and noticed the clause for the parking space. Essentially, I could park, quote, a motorcycle, scooter such as a Vespa, car, truck, SUV, or trailer, end quote, in the space. Gears were turning. For me to be in compliance, I had to have wheels on anything parked in my space. So I went to my local version of Craigslist and I found a wheel container similar to a shipping container. It wasn't cheap, but it was worth every cent. The complex offered storage sheds at an upcharge too. Being fresh out of high school, I didn't have much to store. My neighbor though, did. I threw a lock on the unit and offered it to my neighbor for half the cost of a shed, 35 bucks a month. He was able to move his stuff out of his storage unit where he was paying over $100 a month and the container was available 24-7, 365. He was happy for the arrangement and paid several months in advance. The complex put several tow stickers for out of compliance on the trailer, but I called the tow company and faxed them a copy of the lease where it says trailers are allowed. The container was registered with the county as a utility trailer, so there's nothing they could do. They tried to find me for improper parking, but again, I had proof that I was within my rights. They even offered to remove the charge for parking on my lease if I would relocate the container. <laughs> With what my neighbor was paying, I could cover my water bill every month, so I declined. I stayed 18 months and sold the trailer to my neighbor when I moved out. He had to rent a car to relocate it to his assigned space, but he said it was worth the couple hundred he paid. He ended up saving over $1,000 a year renting from me. Other neighbors even started bringing in their own containers too, even if it meant getting a second space. Sheds were being vacated at such a large volume, the complex tried to give them away at six months free. <laughs> a few took them up on it. The complex amended the new leases to exclude trailers, but they could do nothing about those that already had them in the spot. Instead of moving out and giving notice, renters would reassign their lease to new people so they could be grandfathered into the trailer clause. I drove by the facility two years or so after I moved out, going to friends for Thanksgiving. The complex had been sold to a new owner and changed their name. <laughs> but wouldn't you know, there were still about a dozen wheeled shipping containers parked in that lot. 
oh man, I love this because you go in thinking it's going to be some MC, right? Dealing that justice. And it turns out you're making money, costing them money, saving your neighbor money, and then complying maliciously with the rules. They change the whole freaking agreement. Two years later, it's a whole new company under it. Like, I didn't expect this to go nuclear. I just read a story the other day that went from MC to nuclear and it's like, Okay, OP, you surprised me. You stuck one up on me and you got me. You just totally took these rules and just dodge, dip, duck, dive, and dodge all around them. That's just incredible. I don't, there's nothing more to say. That's incredible. Don't let your kid have consequences. Okay. Posted by Senior Motor 2647. So I'm a 23 year old female nanny. For the family I work for, there are seven kids. Yes, seven. All ranging from 14 years old to 10 months old. I've been working for them for about eight months, and I've never really had an issue. They're a good family, for the most part. A key part here is all the kids are homeschooled, so they don't really get out a lot. Unfortunately, that leads to mom and dad spoiling them quite a lot. And since I've started, I've had quite a bit of a discipline issue. They throw tantrums, throw things, and they scream a lot. Finally, mom recently put on discipline because their tantrums led me to getting an injury. I was pushed down the stairs. So she implemented a timeout routine. <laughs> it was going well for almost everyone. So here is where the story truly begins. The second to youngest is two and a half, almost three. His tantrums are some of the worst. And instead of really disciplining him, she coddles him. If he screams and yells, she just picks him up and gives him whatever he wants. He will also throw things and hit whoever is telling him no, and mom doesn't do anything. On Wednesday this week, mom had an appointment, and when he woke up from his nap and she wasn't there, he freaked out. I tried to calm him by playing games, food, or reading books, but nothing worked. He just got louder and more aggressive. He even hit me and his siblings. Eventually, he woke the baby, and when I got her, he tried to even hurt her. So, with no other real options working to calm him down, I pick him up, sit him on his bed, and said, Time out. You do not behave this way. When you calm down, you can come out. He finally is calming down after several minutes, and mom comes home. Oh, she was quite upset that he got a time out, because she says that he's too young and he doesn't know any better. Now, I understand that he is young, but I've been a nanny for a while and I've learned that two or three is a normal age for discipline, so they learn to know better. I only do a minute per year age and it only goes longer if they can't calm down, though I check in every minute. She was also upset that I used his room as a timeout. N now that part I can get, and hey, I can understand that at this age, associating timeout with where he sleeps, I can agree that we don't do that. But I had to ask, when he's acting like this, what do you want me to do? She said, let me handle it. If I'm not there, give him what he wants. It's not worth the fight. Okay, but what if it's something I can't give? She replied, if you can't just let him go through it, he'll calm down quickly. I looked at her like, are you serious? You do realize how he can be, right? But okay. Cue malicious compliance. The next day, mom had another appointment and she was gone when he woke up. <laughs> and of course, he wanted her and only her. I said, sorry, she's not here. Why don't we play a game? He screams, no. I ask, yeah, you want a snack? He, no, he screams and starts slapping at my hands. I ask to go read a book or go to his sibling's room for playtime. He screams again and he hits me in the face. I told him, please don't hit me. So he screams in my face and goes off throwing things at me and everyone around and just goes off. I tell everyone to go to their rooms. I tried everything to calm him down and it didn't work. So I did exactly what she told me. Absolutely nothing. He continues his tirade, throwing things, pulling things off shelves, and screaming. I obviously kept him from things that would hurt him, like glass and ceramics, and when he got on the table to push something, I picked him up and put him down, though he did bite me really hard when I did that. Not enough to bleed, but enough to leave a good mark. I let this go for about 15-ish uh, minutes until mom came home, and when she did, he was still freaking out. She just goes, what's going on? 
And I explained the situation and told her that, hey, I'm just doing what she said and letting him cry it out till he calms down. She said, that's not what I meant. And I asked, what do you want? She didn't really have an answer, so I told her, I couldn't use discipline and I couldn't calm him, so you said just to let him go, he'd calm down, and he hasn't yet. I made sure that anything dangerous was taken away, but I didn't know what else I could do. Now, respectively, I could have picked up what he threw around, but I wanted her to see what he was capable of, and I wasn't going to risk getting hurt again from taking his things away. She looked upset, but didn't say anything and just looked at him still throwing his tantrum. The baby wakes up and she goes to get her. When she comes back to try and calm him, he screams to pick him up and he hits her and keeps going till she puts the crying baby on the ground and picks him up. I was, <laughs> was kind of shocked that she fed into it. I told her that he's old enough to know what he's doing. He knows that he'll get what he wants when he does these things and it's only going to get worse. And if it's going to continue, I'm going to continue to do nothing because I won't risk getting hurt or the other kids in the process. I showed her my bite mark and she went pale a bit and said he, he did that? And I said yes he did. She took a breath and said, why don't you go home for the day and I'll talk to dad about this. When I came to work this morning, there was a timeout chair for him, and I'm allowed to use it at my discretion. Now, so I will say that because I told in the comments I only get paid $22 an hour and it is low, I am quitting this job soon. Or rather, I already did. My last week is in May. I promised I'd stay till then, and then I have a much better paying job backed up. <laughs> and yes, I did get extra pay for the stairs incident. Not the bite, but yes, for the stairs. Oh, hoo -hoo. see, here's the thing. I'm a dad. I get this. Like, I know how toddlers are. I know how they can be and discipline and all that. This is just insane. Like, you are very right to talk to the mother OP and let them know, hey, I do not feel safe around this kid. Your other kids aren't safe. He is not safe. The baby's not safe. This is definitely something that they need to address three days ago, weeks ago. And like I'm saying, as a dad, as a parent, this, if you let them go, they will go, absolutely. And they will learn from what you do, whether you see them, say it, whatever it is, they'll pick up on it, even if you don't mean for them to. So you gotta nip this spoiling in the bud, as they say before, it just gets out of control like this. OP, way to stand up for yourself and way to tell a good story like this. Confirm work or I don't get to do it? Cool, then I don't get to do it. Posted by Adserum. My fiance, 27 male, and I work for the same company, and this actually happened to him a few days ago, but thought someone might get a kick out of it. We work for a trucking company that has dedicated contracted work. I found the job posting, showed it to him, and we both decided to apply for it. The job posting was listed as Home Daily. When we did the joke of a phone interview, we were told Home Daily. When we finished our initial training and spoke to the account manager, we were told Home Daily. That was all nearly four years ago. Flash forward three years, which is roughly a year ago, and things start falling apart. The company we work for is rather large, and the account manager has very little sway over the contracts that the company negotiates with the client. It's done by a regional manager. So during the yearly contract update in 2022, the client makes more demands and offers less pay. The district manager just wants to keep the client as a customer and agrees blindly without thorough consideration. The biggest change that matters for the story is there were new stores added to the contract to be covered by the account and two out of four of the new stores are not home daily. There were many other changes that happened. That's just the one that most directly affects the next series of events. Due to some other changes that drastically messed up the life of the office workers for the account, the account manager, who had been working for the company for 10 plus years, quits without warning. We get a new account manager, Sarah. A few months later, one of the two supervisors, who had also been with the company 10 plus years, quits without warning. We get a new supervisor. More on him in a tick. Two months after that, the second supervisor, also with the company 10 plus years, quits without warning. You see a pattern here? So now, the account is left with an account manager and a supervisor who both have less than a year's experience flailing to figure everything out. Now back to the bit about the home daily. About six months ago, my fiance started getting the loads that were not home daily. 
it took him a day and a half to complete one of the new stores. Day one, he would go up to the store. Day two, he would come back and do a super short run to conclude his shift before coming home. The first time he got the new store, he called the supervisor to ask about it. The supervisor was confused what needed clarification. My fiance says, will I be getting home? It's a lot of miles for a single day's run. Supervisor says, no, you'll be sleeping roughly at this truck stop about four hours away from home. I thought it was home daily. Who said that? The job was posted as home daily. I was told home daily during the interview. I was told home daily by the previous account manager at training. Well, I don't know anything about that. I wasn't here for any of that. What I do know is that Sarah looked at everyone's contracts and nobody has home daily in the contract. So everyone is expected to take equal share of the new stores to make it fair. Uh, okay, okay, but, but I know there are some guys who are hired home weekends because they sleep at the operating center in their trucks and they go home for four days every so often. Yeah, we have some guys who live out of state. Uh, okay, so, so why aren't they doing the new stores since they don't need to go home every night. As I said, everyone is expected to take equal share to make it fair, and nobody's contracts state home daily or weekend home time or, or, or whatever. That was never part of the deal. I have a family. I took this job thinking that I'd have time with them. I wouldn't have taken the job if I knew it wasn't in my contract that I'd be home daily. Well, you are free to get another job if you like, but without 10 day notice, you'll be blacklisted and ineligible for rehire. So are you quitting or not? My fiance angrily did the load thinking it was going to be a once every now and then again thing. <laughs> Turns out they sent him twice a week, bare minimum. On top of that, most of the miles for the load are back roads up and down windy mountainous roads posted at 35 miles per hour. We are paid by the miles. He drives an additional four hours for this new store for zero extra pay because the store is in the middle of nowhere with no major highways. He takes a major pay loss on top of the inconvenience of not being able to come home, sleep in his own bed, and be with his family. Then, about three months ago, the supervisor messages both my fiance and I to say that going forward, we will be expected to confirm all loads and work or we won't get loads. We receive our work and loads 12 to 24 hours in advance, so we do have some time to confirm them. But it was never a concern before and we already had a lot of duties to fulfill that it wasn't a priority each day to make sure we typed the message uh, confirm store 1124 at the end of our shifts each day. The supervisor called us both out on it and said that this was an important part of the workflow process. I asked him why it was suddenly so important and he insisted it was always important. I told him that I had never had to confirm loads each day and I've never failed to show up for work and on the super odd occasion where I'm unable to do a load, it's because of something like a flat tire or like a truck breakdown that I'm waiting for repairs and I was always sure to contact the office and let them know ASAP. Load confirmations are just busy work that's unnecessary on everybody's part. The boss insists once more, it is and please just do it. At that point, I gave up on the argument. Maybe 60% of the time, I remembered to confirm loads. My fiance, even less. Both my fiance and I received angry messages on our work tablets stating that, going forward, if we do not confirm a load, it will be assumed that we are not able to work the load and it will be pulled from us and we will be placed on standby, which is paid 50% average day's load pay if we aren't called in. Well. Over winter, most of the loads for this new store get cancelled because of it getting drowned in snow. Now, my fiance is getting loads for it again. He got a notification that he was supposed to go to this new store on Sunday. Guess who forgot to confirm his load on Saturday? Sunday, he wakes up, no load, and an angry message from the supervisor. Because of your failure to confirm your load, it has been taken off of you and given to someone else who actually wants the work. You are on standby. Fiance rejoices. Tuesday, he's once more given the new store and forgets to confirm his load and wakes up to no load in an angry message that says basically the same and concludes with, call me. So my fiance calls the supervisor and the supervisor wants to know why it's so hard to confirm loads. My fiance just kind of dismisses it with a shrug and ends the call. We found out Friday, after talking to some other drivers, that all previously home daily drivers are now doing the same thing. They get a store they don't like, mostly these two new stores, they just don't confirm. If we have to confirm to get to do the store, <laughs> we just won't confirm. 
oh, that is good. That is good malicious compliance because it's like you have to go to this store that sucks and nobody wants to work it. Your pay is not really good at all for it, to be honest here. And you know what? You have to confirm every store. You don't get to work it. Look at these gears turning in the head of OP who says, okay, well, I don't want to work it anyway. I'm just not going to confirm it. I'm going to take the day off. And you're just going to have to deal with all this load. Oh, guess what? Everybody else is doing the same thing. How did they not know that this would end up like this? Manglement, you have failed. OP, you have won. And all the other workers too. Nailed it. Only work the posted hours posted by the laser guru. Many years ago, I worked at a place with lots of arcade games and pizza, similar to Chuck E. Cheese. I was hired to do maintenance, repair, and setup of those arcade machines. There was already someone there doing this, but they were never allowed to work more than 40 hours a week, and the place was open 7 days a week, 9 hours a day. So that's 63 hours a week, not including prep for opening and cleanup after closing. At the end of my first shift, I was told that I also was expected to help with cleanup, since everyone that worked close had to help with cleanup. All my shifts were closed shifts. This meant that I had less time before my morning classes than I expected when taking the job, but a few extra bucks was valuable to a starving college student. Fast forward about two months. New manager, fresh out of high school, gets his big boy boots on and starts making rules. First rule. A schedule with everyone's hours for the next week would be posted by Friday morning. Second rule, you must clock in before your posted shift start time, but not more than five minutes before your shift. Third rule, you must clock out at the end of your posted shift end time, no more than five minutes after. At the end of my first shift after these rules were created, I clocked out and left everyone else to do the cleanup. To be clear, it's not like I was getting time and a half overtime or anything. All I expected was to be paid my normal rate and they didn't even want to pay even that. So <laughs> I clocked out and left. At the beginning of my next shift, they were angry. They expected me to clock out and then work over an hour for free. Every single shift. Now, these were only five hour shifts too. I refused. The next week, they posted a new schedule with my shift ending an hour later. Since everyone saw the list, they all got mad. I guess they were all just fine with wage theft until one person refused. The next week, everyone had an extra hour on their shifts, and at this point, his wage theft scheme had failed. Fast forward a couple weeks, and this new manager doesn't come in on Thursday. He doesn't come in until Monday. No schedule is posted. Monday afternoon, I go in to get my check, and I say, see you next week. I'm told my shift started half an hour ago. I say that I made plans since I wasn't on the schedule. Well, no schedule means that I couldn't be on it. The manager points to a schedule posted on the wall, printed just hours before, after some of the shifts on it had already started. I thanked him for posting next week's schedule early and started to leave. Then I was threatened with termination, but I kept walking. I came back a week later and talked with the daytime guy doing the same job. He said it was a bad week. Many machines were down and he was walking around with like $100 in tokens because he was spending much of his time giving refunds to the point that he didn't have enough uninterrupted time to make any repairs. He was also keeping a roll of masking tape with him to tape over the coin slots as the machines failed. This meant a lot more use on the remaining machines which started to show it quickly. I go to clock in and was told that I had been fired. I smiled and walked out. I spoke with the daytime guy a while later. Apparently, they never filled my position. People working with mechanical and electrical knowledge willing to work minimum wage are rare. Instead, he was getting 14 hours a week in time and a half overtime, with a base pay almost twice what I was getting. This extra expense came out of the department budget, which also paid for replacement parts. Even before this, it was never enough to buy parts. This from the department budget thing was from the same manager. He didn't want normal payroll to go up. For a while, basically everyone was carrying around $20 in tokens to give refunds, but all the comps were unacceptable to the manager, so now only the sales desk could issue refunds, which meant that ordering pizza took forever and many people just left angry rather than waiting for a refund. Most machines had tape over the token slots. This backup at the sales desk didn't last long as few people were coming and no one was booking parties anymore. Other than staff, it was basically empty. It didn't even smell like pizza anymore. <laughs> With no customers, the daytime guy finally had time to make repairs, but didn't have the parts to do most repairs. 
As far as I know, that manager stayed there until the place went under about eight months after I was fired for not working a shift that his own rules said that I couldn't work. There was a previous manager that wasn't great, but wasn't trying to wage theft or any of that mess. Generally, things worked out pretty smoothly under her, and there was a long waiting list for booking parties. She was let go as soon as this guy graduated. I don't know why, but I assume nepotism. I could be wrong about that. Maybe she was doing something that got her fired, but if that was the case, then there were at least 10 people that were more qualified for the job. I never met the owner or even knew his or her name. Now, it was entirely possible to clock in or out more than five minutes outside of your scheduled shift, you just wouldn't be paid for that time. Everyone that stayed late clocked out late, and I'm pretty sure none of them got paid for that extra time. I know I clocked out late a few times and I didn't get paid for the extra time. I worked the closing shift on Sunday before the Monday that I walked out, and the previous week's schedule was still posted at that time and I had not been scheduled to work on Monday or Tuesday of that week. I even asked the woman running the show that night about the new schedule and she didn't know, but assumed that we were just following the previous schedule. No one called me after the new schedule was posted. I was in the middle of a school related project and only stopped by to get my check, deposit it and get back to the project. If he hadn't tried to force me to work that day, I probably would have worked the schedule from the previous week, but him being a bully made me follow his rules to the letter. Now even if I was in the wrong to take the week off, he should have been painfully aware what happened when I was gone for a whole week. Firing me when I was about to start working on cleaning up the mess that he started was next level incompetence. The daytime guy, he was no moron, but he also didn't really understand a lot of the machines. When I started, I had been repairing electronics as a part-time job and hobby for years, and finding and replacing a single bad part on a $500 plus arcade board was usually pretty easy for me. Sometimes the repairs looked insane because I had to work with what I could find at Radio Shack, but they worked. The daytime guy was great with mechanical stuff, but when I started, the soldering iron was in a dust-covered box because he'd basically never touched it. He didn't even have the correct type of solder. He had stuff meant for plumbing repairs. When I left, cheap board level repairs turned into expensive board replacements that there was no budget for. Before I got there, this wasn't a big issue because previous management always allocated extra money rather than having a machine just remain dead. New manager did not do this. Not sure why, but if I had to guess, it's because he didn't want to explain why these expensive board replacements stopped and started again perfectly in line with my time there. Someone else was obviously watching the books or else he wouldn't have played games with how to pay a daytime guy all that overtime. This is malicious incompetent compliance because holy cow, like they're wanting to save money so bad, they're forcing these people to work this minimum wage when they are deserving of more due to their abilities and their trade and all of that, and then just tries to cut corners, save money, ends up costing a lot more, messing the whole place out of getting workers. People aren't buying the pizza at the pizza place. People aren't playing the games at the game pizza place. It's all falling apart just to this one stupid decision. OP just stood his ground, said, hey, I'm not putting up with this crap. Thank you for just doing me right, sarcastically, and then boom, the whole place falls apart, gets fired, and it just blows up into smithereens. OP stood your ground, malicious, compliantly. Way to go. Yet another new manager facing the consequences of their actions story, posted by Absurd and Nihilistic. I'll keep the details as vague as possible because I'm still with this organization. I work for a government department. We have offices and locations all over the state. I'm based out of a city that's about a two and a bit hour train ride to our head office. At the time, I was working in a team that had members working remotely all across the state, looking after policy, process, and quality assurance. Our old manager had gone and gotten himself promoted for being genuinely brilliant at his role. So our new manager, Steve, was hired in from the glorious world of banking, and he was here to whip us lazy public servants into shape. A few days after he began his role, he called us all to a teleconference to inform us that he wanted all of us to be at the head office 8 a.m. tomorrow morning for an all-day in-person team meeting. He wanted to see us in meet space to size us up, understanding what we were doing, and see where we weren't keeping up with the private sector. As I mentioned, due to the nature of the work we were doing, we were all across the state. So, in person, whole team meetings were rare, and if they occurred at all, they were booked weeks in advance. 
we were all adept at video conferencing long before COVID. Some of us tried to tell our new high flyer manager that almost none of us were in the same city as him and to be there on such short notice would mean travel expenses, meal allowances, overtime, blah, blah. He didn't seem to care and told us in no uncertain terms to just be at the head office tomorrow at 8 a.m. before abruptly hanging up. Now, I should explain something. I'm one of a handful of union delegates in our department. I know our award back to front, specifically the sections dealing with travel, allowances, and overtime. So I engaged in malicious compliance mode. If Steve wanted us there, fine, but it'll cost him. So I quickly went about emailing my team what Steve had done by requiring us to be in the head office at 8 a.m. and what to do. Because we'd have to travel outside our normal work hours, our workday clock started ticking the moment we left our homes and only stopped once we got home. Some of our team traveled overnight. They were entitled to overtime to travel, a dinner allowance, and accommodation for the night, and the same returning. As someone traveling in the morning before 7 a.m., I was entitled to a breakfast allowance, lunch allowance, and if I got home after 9 p.m., a dinner allowance also. So I left my house at 5 a.m. to catch the only train that would get me there in time. The train was running slightly behind, but I made it in time. So my first three hours of my work day down, and I'd done no work. After a brief period of us introducing ourselves to Steve, he proceeded to spend the next four hours telling us about all of the things he did at the bank, how he made so much money for them, where they'd sent him as a holiday bonus, how we're all stuck in the past in the public service, the work he'd seen wasn't up to private sector standards and blah 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 blah. He had all the cocksureness of a finance bro who had always failed upwards because others had picked up his slack. By 3 p.m., my entire team were into overtime pay territory, and Steve was just warming up with his non-charm offensive. Another three hours goes by with Steve verbally patting himself on the back, deeply in love hearing his own voice, but all I hear is cha-ching, cha-ching. Steve decided that 5 p.m. was a good time to finish up. He stopped mid-sentence, looked at his watch, and unceremoniously said, that's all for today, go home now, and walked out. After I and a few others gave a, a few awkward shrugs to each other, we all packed up and started to make our separate ways home after doing no work all day. I, myself, got to the train station pretty quickly, and I saw a train was leaving soon that would get me home around 8 p.m. Or I could catch the All Stations train and get home closer to 9.30 p.m. Uh, you know what? No matter how fast I could run, I just couldn't catch that earlier train. Darn. I'd just have to catch that All Stations train and be on the clock for another hour and a half, plus have my dinner paid for. <laughs> Such rotten luck. I submitted my claims the next day, four and a half hours at double rate, my train tickets, my taxi fares to and from the train station, my breakfast, lunch, and dinner allowances. For me alone, it was close to a $500 expense claim. The rest of my team followed suit and ensured they claimed everything too. Steve tried to fight us on approval for the claims, but quickly learned that, unlike in the world of banking, most public servants are union, and we'd raise living heck if he denied our award guaranteed allowances. His all-day Steve Fest symposium blew a good $6,000 hole in his budget. <laughs> Needless to say, while Steve was our manager, he never required us to attend an in-person meeting again. Video conferencing was just fine. He only lasted six months before leaving for new opportunities. <laughs> he just went back to his old job at the bank. Guess he was the one who couldn't keep up. You gotta love it here. New guy comes in managing, he's like, I'm better than you. Look at all the cool things I did. You all suck. You need to keep up with my pace. He doesn't listen to the rules. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And the workers do, especially OP, who knows all of the award stuff like the back of his hand. Then coming in like, oh, all right, you want to do this? going to be on your bill man and then boom six grand of a budget later crashed out just 500 for op alone incredible malicious compliance sticking to the rules but just twisting them up just a little bit to make it awesomely fun killer mc story way to go op a new manager was older than me so knew my best way to run an event posted by danny bow 87 
I used to work part-time for my university running student events. Experience is the best teacher. I participated in these events as a student, assisted in these events under someone else as part of my scholarship, and as a staff member ran the events myself. We had a new college head who was much older, approximately 50 or 60, while everyone else was in their early 20s. This woman was the most pig-headed, arrogant fool you can imagine, and despite being new, she wouldn't sit back and observe how things worked or listen to those on our team who'd been there for years. No matter what you told her, when she announced something that wouldn't work or would cause problems, the answer was the same. I'm older, so I know best. Didn't matter if it would take you longer to do it her way, or in one case, if it was technically illegal. Of course, mistakes that we'd warned her would happen were always someone else's fault or swept under the carpet. During event planning, one look at the schedule told me that she hadn't allocated the team properly. Here's our email exchange. I said, mm, probably not a good idea to have the whole team in an hour before the event, most of them standing around doing nothing. Best to get five or so people in for setup, most of the team in for running the event, and hold back another three or four for cleanup. College Head said, no, I want everyone in helping out equally an hour before the event. They're only meant to do two hours work per event. If you have them an hour early for a two hour event, that's three hours. They'll all leave before cleanup and the slackers will slack off and the proactives will end up doing well, everything. I'm older than you and I know best, just do as you are told. Q malicious compliance. Uh, fine, but I've got some personal business to do directly after the event. I'll handle procurement and setup, but we'll need to leave right afterward the event is over. That's fine, on to other business. Day of the event, the whole team showed up an hour before her setup. As expected, five or so did all the setup work, while most of the team stood around on their phones. Some even got bored and wandered off. It was not the team member's fault for standing around. Only so many people can do meal prep and set up tables without getting in each other's way. Ten minutes before the event, College Head shows up and everything is running smoothly. The event was a lot of fun. Some of the team continued to wander off, some ran the events, and most some participated. I was running around as a gopher, letting the college head take credit for the event in front of everyone. <laughs> not doing any work, mind you, but taking credit for it. I made sure to remind her I had to leave right at the end of the event for personal business in front of the other colleague heads several times. To be extra spiteful, I neglected to stop several team members from wandering off who'd done no work other than stand around talking and eating and encouraged several people who'd definitely done two hours worth of work to call it a night and thank them for their help. Forgetful me, I also didn't tell team members standing around during events to start cleaning up as things were finishing. All the free food was gone. All the games were over. Both students and team members were wandering off into the night. And all of a sudden, College Head says, uh, Wait, where are you going? There is so much mess and we've got to put away all the tables and tidy up all the different games, but everyone has left. Oh, hmm, yes, uh, we probably should have saved up a few team members to do cleanup, but they've all already done their two hours. Anyway, like I told you earlier, I've got some personal business to attend to directly after the event, so hey, I'll see you tomorrow. What personal business is it? This will take over an hour to do all this on my own. Hey, I'm sorry, but I said personal business because I wasn't comfortable discussing it with you or the team about what it was, as it really is quite personal, and I'm going to be late. I wandered off home for my personal business of closing all my curtains and playing Xbox in my underwear, chuckling at the thought of that arrogant woman having to do all that work by herself. The formal complaint she put in for me leaving didn't really go anywhere, as I just forwarded the email exchange to management. Sadly, pig-headed people are pig-headed because they don't learn no matter what. I eventually quit, and a few months later was introduced to my replacement's replacement who was also ready to quit. Ah, oh, freaking Karen, man. I tell you what, when you go in a place of work and you're new, 
soak up knowledge. Just because you're older doesn't mean you have the same years of experience in said workplace to know not just what's on the surface level, but the ins and the outs of how the business operates, who, who the people are, how they work with each other. There's so many nuances and little subtleties that you don't get from a book, you get from the street and the learning. Ah, she messed up here. She has messed up and OP knew the way and set her up for failure. And hopefully she learns, but unfortunately, she's not going to. She's a Karen, right? All I gotta do is not get fired, posted by Bonpon Stella. I worked as an inspection specialist for a large flying machine factory in the Seattle area. I've been working in a very specialized job field for about 10 years at this point. During my tenure, I had become proficient at looking up raw material specifications used in the production of large flying machines. I was performing work, not duties, well outside of the scope of my job description because the word got out that I was very good at rooting out the material specs, along with how to process them into flying machine parts. I did this because the actual scope of my work well, was pretty easy, and I had a good system down that kept my backlog down to nothing. I also did this extra work to show my manager that I deserved a decent merit-based raise. And when I said specialized at the top of this paragraph, I mean that I was the only person in this large flying machine company with the certifications to perform the work. Well, raise time comes around and my manager shows up with the slip of paper that shows what kind of raise we got. He hands it to me and tells me how he was able to get me this awesome raise. What he didn't know is that I have a knack for doing mathematical equations in my head very quickly, and I quickly discovered that he was blowing smoke at my butt. So before he runs off, I tell him to stick around and do the math on my computer to show what I actually got. After I run the numbers, I show him exactly what I had done in my head. The raise I got was what was guaranteed by our union contract and no more. I confronted him about this and he had nothing to say about it. I told him that I was doing the work of an employee at a higher job rating and that I should be getting compensated as such. He tells me to put together a package of what I've been doing and make an appointment for both of us to meet with HR to present my case for an upgrade. I put together my work package, set an appointment, and show up for the meeting. The HR lady looked at my work package and was amazed that I hadn't been upgraded. We chatted for about 15 minutes because my manager didn't show up and we were giving him a chance to make the meeting. He ended up being a no-show, which meant no upgrade. Fast forward a few weeks, and it's time for us to write up a list of our yearly goals and objectives. Apparently, this is some big deal for management, and they like to use these items to hang over our head as a carrot to chase for raises in the following year. There's this form that we're given to fill out what our business goals are for the next year and how we'll execute our plan to make those goals. And at the bottom of the form, there's a line for our signature and the date. It was the easiest, easiest goals and objectives form that I have ever filled out. I literally signed and dated the blank form and handed it to my manager. <laughs> Needless to say, he had an issue with it and he started in on me right then and there. It was in an office where at least six of his management colleagues also had desks. He tells me that I can't just sign a blank sheet and I tell him, hm, I just did, a bit louder than my normal speaking voice. And then, with the attention of his colleagues now garnered, I told him everything that I had been doing above and beyond my job description, how he gave me the BS story of the great raise I got, and his no-show at the upgrade meeting. Then I iced his cake by telling him, all I have to do is not get fired and I'm still going to get the contractually guaranteed raise, so I ain't doing anything extra, starting with this stupid goals and objectives form. The look on the faces of his colleagues was of utter shock and he had nothing to say, so I left. He never came back and pressed me to fill out the form. Maybe it was because he still had one of my size 10 stuck deep in his butt. Maybe he realized that he really screwed the pooch and couldn't face me. Shortly thereafter, I was offered a new gig in a department that came with an upgrade and a raise. My salary doubled in the 10 years that I spent there. Oh, I like this because it's like, hey, you know, throw me a bone. I'm doing so much stuff. I'm going above and beyond extra work, you know, not just doing the bare minimum. Nobody else can literally, literally nobody else can do this work. And then he says, here, fill out your form. I'm not showing up for the meeting. I don't really care. Do this. You know, I'm not going to help you, but you need to help me because we need these papers filled out in the manglement. And then OP stands up for themselves and says, hey, look, this is what my manager's saying. This is what he's doing. This is what's really happening here. And that is how OP just 
bro brutally nails that malicious compliance. Way to go, OP. Don't calculate a table's bills the moment you get their ordered ticket. It makes it hard to keep track. <laughs> you got it, boss. Posted by Danver Santiago. For starters, I'm a 23-year-old university student working part-time at my aunt's restaurant to make a little extra moolah before the academic year starts. My job is pretty simple. It's an all-rounder job where I need to take people's orders, send tickets to the kitchen, calculate each table's bills, and handle payments and clear tables. Basically, I'm currently working part-time as a waitress. I'm only here until the end of this week because I secured another gig elsewhere before the academic year starts. So, hey, I figured why not finish this week for a little extra cash before then. I get along with most of the staff, all of whom are a decade or so older than me, and said individuals work at the restaurant full time. There's another part-timer, he's 19, who's working here, and he comes to work whenever he's able since he's studying too. He wasn't around for a couple of weeks, so I've been left to sort out most waitressing matters. My shifts during lunch hour get particularly busy, which is why my system keeping the workflow super smooth is a crucial point to this post. The moment after bills have been settled, tables need to be cleared immediately because new customers come pouring in and some insist on being seated even before the tables have been cleared or wiped down. I came up with a system in the three weeks that I've been working here that works for both myself and my colleagues. Upon receiving tickets for orders that have been received, I always key in their order according to the table they're sat, so that it's less time consuming in the event that other customers want to settle their respective bills. Customers are expected to come to the payment counter when they're ready to pay, so this system is a lot easier and much more efficient than letting tickets pile up and only calculate the bill right when the customers are about to pay, which results in a longer line. I always make it a point to ask customers if their food has all arrived, if they were satisfied with the quality of their order, and if they ordered anything else that I hadn't seen on their tickets. Once they verify their orders are correct, that's all. I go about my day and mind my own business. That was until the other part-timer approached me earlier today. His point was an eyebrow raiser for sure. I'm not the type of person to pick fights or argue, so since he was so insistent that my way of doing things was making it difficult for him to keep track of additional orders at the table, I decided to just, well, let him have at it since he was so happy to tell me how to do my job. I simply smiled and nodded at him, making a beeline to the cleaning supplies and thinking to myself, so you want to stop punching in people's orders? Sure thing. For a solid hour or two, I only collected the tickets, bringing them to the cash register and letting them pile up, just as he requested. When I noticed customers stand up from their seats and make their way to the payment counter, I would speed walk to the cleaning supplies and start collecting plates to show that my hands were occupied and that I wouldn't be able to sort out people's bills. I left it all to my dear coworker who tried telling me what to do and how to do it. It was the right call to make because the line that followed due to his insistence on changing the system snaked about halfway through the restaurant full of customers waiting their turn to pay their bill. Once lunch hour had died down, I smiled to myself and went back to keying in people's tickets the way I always had. My part-time co-worker sheepishly approached me with new additions to existing orders since then. There is no MC greater than the kind where you say, hey, I've got the experience with this job, I know what to do, I know how to work it. Oh, your idea? Hey, look, it's just going to make things harder. And then they say, oh, no, it's fine. And then you put them right into the fire and say, okay, well, then you try it maliciously complying, showing them hands-on with first-hand experience, hey, I'm wrong, you're right, I have to admit my failure. And then they know from there on to check their self before they wreck their self. Way to go, OP. I should accept request even though there could be legal issues? <laughs> Got it. Posted by Bell Pepper Glass. I, a 22-year-old male, work as a teacher at my college's application school. We work little hours and we get paid a small amount of money too. It's like an internship. For the past semesters, I've been dealing with a supervisor who we'll call Sheila. She's around a 40-year-old female. Sheila is one of the four supervisors at the school. The supervisors usually drop by her class once in a while to check if the students are having their needs met or to solve any issues, like a student wants to retake a class and so on. 
My issue was that Sheila has a strange interest in me, and for some reason focused way too much on what I did at class to the point of obviously overlooking other teachers. Because Sheila isn't a professor from my department, she only knew about me from colleagues or rumors around college. Such rumors include, I bring whole meals to college instead of eating at the cafeteria like everyone else. <laughs> what? I was supposed to be in another college. Why? And I'm not actually from the state. Now this one is true. And so on. She confronted me about these rumors in front of colleagues, but I brushed it off, which seemed to annoy her. Sheila then began to try and find out things that I wasn't able to do. She asked me questions about buying a very specific device, like imagine something like a Wi-Fi camera, which I, of course, wasn't able to answer. She giggled and looked smug after that. I, however, managed to answer her other questions, even if they didn't relate to my field, which made her slightly upset. In one of those semesters, an older student that's a lawyer, we'll call Amanda, female, around 60, started to request some things from me that I wasn't able to nor had permission to give. Such things include a free, school-approved, good digital dictionary, extremely detailed and personalized exam and exercise corrections, detailing of my methodology, explanations of the goals of every lesson, and audio transcripts of exam materials. Due to Amanda's lawyer occupation, she worded those requests to me in a very formal way. Our school is careful with lawyer students due to some legal issues that happened in the past, something like a student trying to fire a teacher because they got caught cheating. Because I wasn't able to fulfill her request due to lack of permission, and I'm not interested on in going to court, I asked her to forward her request to my superiors. And guess who answered them? Sheila. Sheila didn't even bat an eye to Amanda's request and started forwarding them to me, saying that I should comply. Because Amanda got what she wanted, she began sending more and more requests, to the point that Sheila just told me to accept all forwarded requests and just be fast about it. <laughs> so I did it. I sent materials, transcripts, and the like, all in the name of the school. Amanda was very happy, and Sheila was loving the extra work that I was doing. She thought she was being smart and had the upper hand. <laughs> well, not until Sheila tried to embarrass me in front of my class. She said that despite my excellent work, I'm standoffish, and that's funny. My students tried to correct her statement, but she just ignored them by saying, really? and swiftly left. She tried to pull this again at an online class and another group of students shut her down again. I emailed her shortly after that saying that I would prefer her observations about my work to be done in a private setting rather than in front of the whole class. Sheila replied immediately, denying everything and said that I was imagining stuff. She even tried to manipulate me by saying that she was the most vocal supervisor in my favor and was ceaselessly requesting a promotion for me, which I never got. In the end, she assured me that no further comments would be made. That's what I foolishly thought. During a meeting, my boss addressed to all of us a concern from an unnamed supervisor that said us teachers were getting embarrassed by her presence. My boss said that such behavior was unacceptable and they are there to help. At that moment, I saw red. I couldn't believe Sheila had twisted my words and told my boss about the email exchange portraying me as the bad guy. At one point in the meeting, I asked the other supervisors if we teachers were supposed to do everything I was asked to do for Amanda. They all replied a firm no to and even gasped when I mentioned transcripts. Basically, our school doesn't have the authority to provide transcripts and students could legally contest test results if a mistake was present in the transcription. I then requested a meeting with my boss and another supervisor about this. In the meeting, I pointed out that they said that we weren't supposed to be doing those tasks, but I was being ordered to do them anyway. My supervisor quickly opened the email and discovered that Sheila was sniping emails from me and my students and exclusively replied to all of them using her personal phone before others could do or see anything. We also discovered that she was archiving some of the requests so they wouldn't be found easily. I helped them dig everything up and my boss and the other supervisor said it was inappropriate of the supervisor to do that and they would talk to her about this. I left the meeting feeling relieved and hoped something would be done. After a few weeks, I saw the supervisor in person, but she just said, excuse me, and quickly left to another room. I kid you not, this woman 
treats me like I am the plague now. She avoids me, doesn't address me directly anymore, and best of all, was apparently assigned to another role that doesn't involve supervision of teachers. Even though she hasn't been greatly punished, I bet she'll think twice before making her comments again. Holy cow, this was like directly targeting OP, gaslighting, and just going the extra mile underneath everyone else, under the table, not allowed to, tell them just to prove everything. Like this person did some really messed up stuff and thanks to OP's due diligence and malicious compliance was able to uncover this whole nasty scheme and expose Sheila for who she truly was. OP, way to go. Have me work throughout the pandemic, promote me, and then don't accommodate my disability? You can pay my short-term disability insurance for that. Posted by Random Cashier 75. Let me do a little backstory first. I started working at Walmart before the COVID-19 pandemic happened as a full-time apparel employee. I happened to have grand mal epilepsy that started in my mid-20s, around uh, 2015. I'm also quite understanding of other people's disabilities and often try to work with them since I can relate to having issues. So for example, I use hand gestures and or writing for deaf coworkers. This helps with basic communication that most hearing people don't bother with and it's normally appreciated that I do this. I got to stay in that exact same position throughout 2020 and part of 2021. Naturally, I had to still go to work as an essential employee, deal with the anti-masking idiots, and worry about both of my parents who also work in retail. I managed to get myself promoted to the digital shopping department by transferring stores and pointing out certain key skills that I have that are, well, really useful for retail in 2021. I had politely asked for the minimal requirements for my department manager of 1. Being able to take medication at work and 2. Not having to bring orders out to cars because I lack what's known as an aura. Basically, summed up here, I can't sense seizures coming. Though I don't have them very often due to medication, a grand mal plus a busy parking lot at work seems like a bad idea. My department manager agreed to this condition as long as I did other work to help out the digital team instead, which was completely reasonable to ask for in my opinion. So as per the request for a lot of the closing shifts that I'd work, I'd take up phone duty, pre-set up the orders to go out, and or do returns for the department. The issue here was the personal department person. She kept forgetting about my condition repeatedly over the next year. Now this was despite me bringing in medical notes from my neurologist for my file, pointing this out more than once on why I shouldn't be scheduled solo, and, and having the department manager talk to her. Now after over a year, she scheduled me completely solo for a closing, which I noticed and texted my department lead about. I did the official suggestion of hers, despite my thoughts that corporate Walmart was likely even dumber than her on basic disabilities. I only asked for the exact same things that I asked my department manager for, both very, very logical and minimal accommodation request. As I suspected, Walmart Sedwick said, we can't do this unless you change departments. All departments suggested either wouldn't work due to time and or location, or they were back at the same level as apparel, which would lower my position and pay. Sedgwick put me on an automatically placed LOA, leave of absence, after a few days without my permission. This was, quote, to allow me to figure out what I should do, end quote, over the next four months. I called up and I asked the Walmart Benefit Center about this. As of late 2019, Walmart signed all of their employees up for a free to the employees short-term disability insurance without officially telling them. I filed to get this insurance to pay for my entire LOA, politely explained my situation to a total of three people and was given a short-term disability payments with back pay for exactly when they put me on leave. I'd rather have my paycheck and insurance stick around for a while despite Walmart and Sedgwick being idiotic. I quit Walmart after having gotten holiday employment with Target for two months at that point. Now listen here, you do not mess with people's disabilities in this regard. This is a dangerous thing, putting this person out to work alone by themselves and just basic accommodations, being a kind human being. 
Is that not enough? So then OP says, I'm not just worried about my job, I'm worried about my safety. So they go take it up to the next level, malicious compliantly, and come back with a huge W win right here for themselves, their disability insurance, their quality of life, and their career. OP, way to go. Don't bother me unless it's an emergency, posted by I Like the Quiet Zeppo. This morning, I got into my car and I realized that I left my headlights on. Thankfully, modern technology meant that it had automatically switched off when the key was removed, but it reminded me of a time where that wasn't so. Many, many years ago, I was working one of my first jobs in a little cafe, nearing the end of my training period. It was a quiet day, perfect to put the newbie on with only one experienced staff member. The experienced staff member called in sick. Boss had to come in and cover until Sue could come in early. Boss wanted to use the time on site to do paperwork out the back. I'll be in here if you have any questions. I very annoyingly had a lot of questions. How to avoid an incorrect transaction, where to find more special paper for the credit card machine, what to do when the coffee grinder stopped working, and so on. Finally, Boss said, I'm busy. Don't bother me unless it's an emergency. Let me know when Sue is here. Shyly, I replied, that's just what I came to tell you. Sue just arrived. Great, any more questions, just ask her. Sue took over the coffee area and got me on restocking, clearing tables, and emptying the bins and other necessary grunt work. I went out to the outside bins through the little staff parking area and saw my boss's old car there with the headlights still on. I went back to my boss's office. Uh, boss, is it an emergency? Boss snapped. Not to me, I replied. Then go away. I left quickly. I went to tell Sue instead. Uh, Sue, and then I changed my mind. Boss doesn't want to be disturbed unless it's an emergency, so I'm supposed to ask you if I have more questions. Sue and I worked pleasantly until the end of my shift a few hours later. As I gathered my things to leave, Boss ran by me, knocking into me a bit. Without turning around to see if I was okay, Boss said, Sorry, I'm in a rush. I slowed down to see what happened next, getting out my brick of a phone to text my mother that I was on my way home. I could hear my Boss swearing, OP! Oh no, Boss realized that what I was going to tell them earlier and I was in trouble. Can you bring your car in and give me a jump start? My battery is flat. Now only a few cars could fit, so only senior staff and management could park there. I walked here. I lived 10 minutes of a walk up the hill. I raced off before Boss could blame me. The next time I was on shift with Sue, I asked what happened to Boss. Well, headlights got left on. He got a flat battery. Boss tried to jump start it with my car, but it didn't work. Had to call a taxi. <laughs> Funny that neither of us noticed the lights were on when we walked by it. And I realized, of course, she had to have seen it when she walked in. I can only imagine why she didn't say anything either. You know, it's just hilarious because the boss said, don't bother me if it's an emergency only. And OP tried to say, hey, dude, look, you know, you got a problem here. And boss is like, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. What I'm doing is always more important than what my worker that I'm trying to train that is brand new may need to ask me. Like, in what universe does someone say this? Well, obviously this one, because this really happens and this is the world that we live in, of course, with Karens and bad bosses. But way to go, OP, for standing your ground and bringing out the OPMC, Malicious Compliance. Dead Bird, posted by The Last Man Bear. So before I start the story, I need to give some background on my current job and my terrible boss. I work at an answering service. It's a company that handles the phones for several companies like plumbing companies, construction companies, and a few others. We handle the phones and take messages for them and page or text them out to the people working. On to my terrible boss. She is absolutely a greedy, horrible person and has no shame about it. She owns the answering service and also owns five other houses, one of which she rents out to someone. The office for the company is in shambles. The carpet was ruined from years of being walked on with no upkeep. The walls have holes in them, and the computers and equipment are incredibly old. I'm talking that some of the phones are still using 2000 old. 
she only has barely enough computers working for the employees to work on. There's maybe 10 or 12 old computers stocked up in the corner that don't work anymore. And she also treats the employees terribly. We'll have like 10 or 15 calls coming in at a busy time with one employee working and she won't lift a finger to help. She'll just tell the employee to hurry up and yell at them when they can't handle the workload. Earlier this week, the computer at my station stopped working. Now I'm pretty sure it can be fixed, but my boss doesn't want to get it fixed. So instead of getting the computer fixed, she told me to go work out of one of her houses with a computer that has the necessary programs and equipment. The house she wanted me to go to is actually about 10 minutes closer to where I live compared to where the office is. So, yeah, whatever, I, I didn't make a big deal about it. She had me sign a non-disclosure form to not tell anyone about her house and included that I was not allowed to touch anything in the house. I was only allowed to touch the equipment that involved work. Again, I just thought, whatever, and she just signed it. So, into my story. I'm sitting at the desk earlier this week and it was super slow, so I was reading a book. Then I notice her cat coming in from the doggy door with a dead bird in her mouth. So I call my boss and the call goes like this. Hey, uh, so your cat just walked in and it had, don't you freaking dare touch my cat. Uh, but the, the cat, if you touch my cat, I will fire you. You hear me? Y yeah, all right. And then I hung up. I did absolutely jack crap about it. On my way out, I glanced down the hallway and saw a pile of feathers and bird parts all over her bed which I laughed so hard at. I'm finishing up school in the next couple of months, so I'm biting the bullet and finishing off before I quit, since I don't want to find a part-time job for a month. But when I quit, you bet I'm going to tell someone about the work violations. The great, great, great part about this MC is that the boss trusted the employee to go to the house. The employee was doing their due diligence and kindness, helping the boss with the cat situation. Even through all of that trust, boss still says, nope, you need to stop and just do what I told you to, no matter what emergency might be popping itself up, which just completely took OP over the limit, straw that broke the camels or cats or birds, technically in this story, back, and then all the work violations are now going to get exposed. So this malicious compliance turns into a pro or even a nuclear revenge, depending on your definition of the word. OP, you nailed it. No money back? We'll see about that. Posted by Deus Ex Pirate Pete. A few years ago, when my kids were three and seven, we were looking for a new car for my wife. After scouring Auto Trader, we're in the UK, we saw a Mazda Zato 6, decent mileage, couple of owners in a small trader's down south. It was about an hour away, so we hopped in my car and went to go look at it. We arrived at the site, which had some decent looking cars, and it was a nice and tidy place, so didn't ring any alarm bells. We were greeted by one or two Romanian brothers who seemed knowledgeable and pretty free of the hard sell. I had a look around the car, very little rust, oil looked clean, tidy inside with not too much wear. The only two things I found was the head unit panel was not in place correctly and one of the brackets by the engine had a, a bit of a dent in it, but it was a non-functional bracket and it didn't appear to have a prank, so okay. I took it for a test drive and it was okay. My wife liked it, so we paid part cash, part card. A few days later, after sorting the insurance, we went and collected it. By the time we got home, my wife got out and immediately said, there's something wrong with this car. I took it for a drive and yes, it had low power, sounded terrible and did not feel safe. I immediately rang them and they were pleasant enough and said bring it back and they would have their garage look at it, the same garage that had MOT'd it barely two weeks earlier. I said I didn't want to bring it back and I would pay out of my pocket to get it assessed by my garage. <laughs> they didn't like this, but I didn't give them a choice. After a couple of days of being at my local garage, who we've used for years and trust, even though they're a bit pricey, we got the report. It ran to two pages, which I will summarize using the comment the mechanic gave us when we picked it up. Mechanically, this is the worst car I have ever seen. How it passed an MOT is beyond me. You wouldn't have seen it on a visual inspection, but this is a nail. Oh dear. 
So I rang the dealer and sent them the report. Again, pleasant enough, said bring it back and we can discuss it and sort out the refund. Cue the malicious compliance. So, the following Saturday, now one and a half weeks since we bought it, we all trooped back down there and walked into their little porta cabin office. The two brothers were sat with their faces like slapped bums. I will tell you now, sir, you will not be getting a refund today, not until our garage has checked it. My wife and I looked at each other and our hearts sank. What followed was an hour of back and forth with me explaining that we were within our rights to a full refund within 30 days of purchase. Now, this is true for goods in the UK, but I had no idea if it applied to vehicles. After an hour, my wife and I stepped outside. The kids were getting bored and fractious. What are we going to do, says my wife. Well, I'm not leaving without a refund, I said. Agreed. And that was it. We went back into that office. We argued back and forth, revisited the same point over and over while the kids moaned and cried and begged to leave. But we sat there and we argued very calmly, very matter-of-factly, without getting angry or raising our voices. At a couple of points, one brother left to serve people who had walked into the yard. And at one point, he came in with another couple who were interested in a car. They heard us talking, and I slyly shook my head at the couple, and they backtracked and left. One of the brothers was raging behind his eyes. They threatened to call the police, and I begged them to do it so we could clear this up and leave. They didn't. After, and I am not exaggerating, five hours of this, my wife and I stepped out, and we were stood just outside the office door. Look, we can't stay here any longer. The kids are hungry and tired and mental, my wife says. I saw the door open, barely an inch. Okay, take my car and go feed them. I'm not leaving. I think I'll just call the police and get this sorted, but if I have to stay here until tomorrow morning, we are getting our money back, I said. I noticed the door close again. Really, she said. Just give it a minute. Let's go back in a sec. Okay, she says, looking irritated. We go back in and one brother is counting out cash on the table. At this point, it's early evening. Sir, the deal we will do is, we will give you a full refund if you don't mention this car on any review site. It was X in cash and X on a card, yes? Less than five minutes later, we were back in our car leaving the nail behind, cash in hand and card refunded. We had found a pub that does food and we were heading there rapidly. The kids were okay now that they knew food was near. With everything sorted, my wife and I looked at each other for a second and cheered and whooped, hollered and banged the steering wheel, making the little lad cry, bless him. We could not believe that after five hours of back and forth, crying kids, belligerent salesmen, we had won. We had flipping well won. This sort of thing never happened to us and yet there we were. We felt like the kings of the world and no one would ever mess with us. This MC right here is dedication. Like, dad here, bless us so he, he went in, he's like, no, we know what's right and we're getting that right answer back to us. And the other guys, this is so beautiful because the salesman knew that these people were driving sales away that came in the door, screwing them out of more money that they could have had way more of if they had just stuck to their plan and been honest. Actually, no, that probably wasn't even their plan at all. Way to go, OP, for your due diligence, your determination, not giving up for your family, and very good malicious compliance. You can't use a competitor's phone, posted by Mashiga Kerr. Well, folks, for those of you who don't know, I work on cell phone towers. I used to work in an extremely remote rural area for a now defunct small cell phone company. The conversations are to the best of my recollection. The area I worked was the type of area where you could drive for hours and not see anything but field, forest, and animals. Most of the sites I had were what is referred to as island sites, meaning that they don't hand off to another cell tower. And most of these sites were about 30 minutes apart on a good day. Eh, well, I worked nights, but you get the drift. So it came around that a competitor had located quite a few sites near our sites. I, being of the mindset of efficiency, purchased a phone from them, and with approval from my boss, 
kept it ready, especially during upgrades. But he was the type when anyone above him says, Boo! He'd jump and ask if he jumped high enough or if he should jump again. So a couple of months later, Boss's Boss leaves and we get new Boss's Boss who spent 250% of his life in the confines of New York City. Within his first week, he's working the switch and sees me call in from our competitor's number. Of course, he takes offense to this and it quickly comes down that nobody may use a competitor's phone. I bring up my concerns, but <laughs> you know, they don't need to do this in New York City, so we're not going to do this. Mind you, my job is to shut down our sites and upgrade or repair them. Yes, I'm the guy you love to hate when you can't make a phone call. And so it happens a short time later, I'm at one of my most remote sites, a 45 minute drive to the next site on a good day, about four hours from home. Now I do my diligence, I call the switch, I tell them what I need them to change and shut down the site. An hour later, the site's not up. So I go through everything on my end. Um, yep, everything's good. Ah, crap. Now there's a couple of pay phones, but they were the competitor's phone. So I start driving. It takes me about an hour and a half to get to the next site because of a freak blizzard. Crap, that site's down too. Roll on to the next site, usually in about 30 minutes, but it's snowing hard and the roads are crap. Two and a half hours hours on the road after leaving the original site, I finally get service. So I pull over and in five minutes we figured out the switch crossed a number and took down the wrong site. Switch promises to fix it and I drive three hours back to the original site. 30 minutes later, it's still not up. This time it takes an hour to get to the closest site, call the switch again and they, they get it up after about like 30 minutes and I verify it's up. Hooray! But I still have to drive back, clean up, and make some testing calls. 18 some odd hours after I left my driveway, I pull back in and submit my time, complete with the overtime. It's my Friday, so I turn off my phone and I hit the bed. Monday morning, I turn on my phone for our weekly call-in meeting and I crap you not. It buzzes with new text and voicemails for 20 straight minutes, all from boss and boss's boss. Well, I jump on the call and first thing I hear is boss's boss. Why the heck did you have a nearly 9 hour outage for a 30 minute upgrade? Before I get a word in, and how dare you claim 9 hours of overtime where you were clearly freaking around not doing your job. So I tell him, well, there were a series of issues outside of the site and a freak snowstorm slowed my response. I hit send on emails that I had already prepared before clocking out for the weekend with a full rundown of events of the night as a reply to the emails coming down from him dismissing my needs for a competitor's phone and included his boss, the vice president of the company. Boss's boss says, I don't want to freaking hear excuses from you. Why didn't you just use a freaking payphone and call for help? Literally everyone on the call groaned. Uh, in case you don't remember, I just replied to a series of emails where you forbade me under threat of termination from using a competitor's phone. At this point, I hear VP join our call. And since pay phones are owned by a competitor, I spent six hours driving around in a blizzard searching for service instead of spending 45 minutes to an hour and making a call on a competitor's phone. Oh, I never freaking threatened to terminate anyone. Don't be stupid. You could have used a pay phone. The VP cuts in. It appears, boss to boss, that you do not remember what you said, and Mr. Kerr has clearly documented his actions on the night in question. Boss to boss, please call me immediately. Thank you, everyone else, for your time this morning. Please have a good day. This meeting is over. Boss's boss was removed shortly afterwards, having a fairly rocky rest of his short employment. I now work for the company which purchased our competitor. I've moved to my home state, though I still work a rural market, and it's not quite as bad. This is the greatest thing because, ever the greatest thing, because this was covering his butt. His boss said, do this, you get that stuff in writing, you get that down. And you say, alright, well hey, if this fallout hits, you told me to do the thing, I am just following your rules. You are safe. Ideally, because the boss told you to do it, you did it, you said this is not a good idea, the boss does it anyway, and then it fallout comes on him. OP, you handled this very eloquently, very 
Ah, oh, just top of the line, top notch. Nice work, OP. Return the car empty? <laughs> Done. Posted by MA77MC. Talking to my grandmother earlier today reminded me of this story from a number of years ago. I live in Sydney and used to fly up to the Gold Coast around three or four times a year to check on my grandmother. Now the whole family was in Sydney, so someone would usually pop up once each month to help her out. Anyway, I would always rent a car from Hertz when I arrived. At the time, they offered a prepaid fuel option where you would pay an amount and not need to refuel before return. It was usually less than you would pay at the local service station, so I usually took this option. As I picked up the keys to this shiny new manual Toyota Corolla, the woman said to me, So you have the prepaid fuel, just bring it back empty. After a few days of relaxing by the beach, I ran a few errands for my grandmother in the morning before my 1500 flight. When the fuel light comes on and the words of hurt staff ring in my ear, bring it back empty. Not wanting to push it, I pulled into 7-Eleven and put two liters in and went on my way. The light didn't extinguish, but with the distance I needed to cover, I figured I'd be safe. About 1300, my grandmother is pushing me out the door, telling me to catch my flight, so I make the 6 kilometer trip to the airport, the whole time anxiously wondering if I'll make it with the fuel remaining. As I was coming up on the airport, I felt the engine sputter, but it was still going. Heading in, it started sputtering more, so much so that I genuinely thought that I'd run out mere meters from my destination. As I pulled through the boom gate for rental returns, I put my foot down and got a final burst of acceleration. The car determined to be the little engine that could. My finish line in sight, and the car is going to make it. Until it didn't. The car stalled. With the momentum, I had pulled it into a spot marked Avis, and it only made it about halfway in. I tried in vain to restart it, but it wasn't to be. I got out and pushed the little engine that could into bay 109. I was 11 bays short of the first marked Hertz, and I was a broken man, my goal so near yet so far. Torment ran through my mind. Did those 11 bays mean that I was short of my goal to bring it back empty? I mean, it was in the rental car park after all, and it wasn't uncommon for people to just, well, park in a spot and ignore who owns the spot. I walk into the terminal, carry on roller bay in one hand, car keys in the other, and walk up to the rental returns. Can I help you? The same young woman asks as I walk up to her. I'm returning a car, I said. She takes the paperwork and asks where I'd parked it. Uh, Bay 109, it says Avis, I respond, her not looking up. She shrugs and talks into the radio on the counter. Return uh, 109, she finally says. Did you fill it up? I say no, and she asks roughly how much is left. Well, none, I say. Oh, so the petrol light is on, no worries, she says. Uh, no, I reply. I mean, it ran out of fuel as I drove in. I had to push it into the parking spot. The helpful woman gives me a blank stare for a full 10 seconds. Wait, you, you let it run out? You said return it empty, so I accepted your challenge. It seems I win, I said with a mixture of pride and embarrassment. The staff member turns to her colleague, points at me, and says, uh, prepaid fuel, and he says he ran out in the car park. The guy looks at me with a smirk and says, Really? Well, it wouldn't start back up, I reply as someone comes in from the outside to get the keys. It's out of fuel, the woman says. Uh, That's okay, I'll run up to Shell after I've washed it, he replies. Both terminal staff look at him as the woman, looking at me, says, No, the customer says he had to push it into the spot. Cue the largest eyes I've ever seen. I have to see this. He walks out with me, and the guy from behind the counter following behind opens the car and tries to start it. It's cranking, but it won't turn over as all three of us burst out laughing. I've never had one fully out before, he says when I tell him. The woman in there told me to bring it back empty. As I walk inside, laughing to check my bags. Hey, she said bring it back empty. You brought it back empty. I mean, they were pretty dead set on saying, you know, hey, if it's prepaid, you do the prepaid thing. You don't fill it up. Well, hey, you had to get it back. You had to do your thing. They said to bring it back empty. You did. They just didn't specify where and all the little details. And that is exactly why this is malicious compliance. OP. Let the kids work. Walk the line of breaking child labor laws. Fine. Posted by Chibi T. A bit of background. So a few years ago, when I was in my second year of college, I got a job at a well-known beauty supply store. 
A red flag at first was that my manager, let's call her C, didn't give me my hourly wage until my first day and I came in to sign the onboarding paperwork. Uh, but college is expensive and I got my first apartment at that time, so a job was a job. One day, I come into my afternoon shift, and I see two kids putting out stock from boxes onto the shelves. One was about 10, and the other maybe like 6 or 7. I was very confused, so I walked to the back room to clock in, and I asked my coworker what was up with the kids. And she told me, they're her grandkids. Still a little confused, I shrugged it off, until C came back from her lunch break, and I decided to ask her what to do about the kids, because they were well, kind of in the way, and we had quite a few planograms to do. Now they're essentially the shifting of shelves and the products on the shelves to make room for new products, or removing old ones that the company will no longer sell. C then decided to tell me that she is watching them today, and decided that, well, since it was stock day, that she was going to get them to help and give them like yeah, 10 bucks each at the end of her shift. She usually opened and left a couple hours before close, so that was close to about an 8 to 5 kind of hours, meaning these kids have been doing this for a while, and just for 10 bucks. Now, our merchandise wasn't heavy, except for like three to four different gallon sized bottles of shampoo and conditioner that we kept for salons, but it just didn't sit right with me that this woman was basically employing her underage grandkids to do work for her in this store. And there's quite a few chemicals that we handled that would sometimes come spilled in the box, and if we didn't handle them with gloves, we could risk burning ourselves. I know, because I made the mistake my second week there and burned my hand a bit with an unknown combination of bleach, toner, and something else in a mishandled box of assorted hair products and bottles. But I digress. So yeah, breaking the law and whatnot. So I tell her, and this is roughly how the convo went. I said, Hey, so this is pretty wrong, and I don't feel comfortable working alongside these children. If they get hurt or injured by one of the shelves, or a spilled chemical product, then we can all be held liable. That sounded reasonable to a 19-year-old me, right? <laughs> wrong. C said, I don't appreciate the back talk, young lady. Those are my grandchildren, and I do with them what I please. Not to mention, I am the manager here, not you. So get started on those planograms. The pictures are due in two days. Me, still advocating for her to do the right thing, said, I just don't think that it's right that you're, you're paying them essentially to do this dangerous job. It goes against child labor laws, and I don't think I can get my work done around them. The store was so small that there was only one short wall or shelf in the middle of the store that's splitting it in half, so there's not much wiggle room to do planogram stuff with kids and customers in the way. C said, I'm not repeating myself, GBT. Mind your business and do as you are told. I won't repeat myself. I have a split second to think about what I'll do next before she walks away. I never cared about getting on her bad side because I never did anything wrong. She just never liked me for some reason. So I decide to say, hey, hey wait, can you email me your directions for how to maneuver around the kids? I want to make sure that so and so, the next shift coworker who's coming in in about 30 minutes, knows what to do in case I'm in like the back or something. C rolls her eyes, already annoyed with me an hour into my shift, and says, whatever. 20 minutes later, I get an email in my inbox, nothing but the subject in all caps. My grandkids will be working stock while everyone else does the new planograms. I gave the kids $10 to help in the store and have lunch in the fridge. And that's verbatim with a quick search in my email. <laughs> she basically typed her own career grave with that one. So my little plan slowly comes into effect. I decide that I'm going to email that exact thing to the coworker who came in, even though we already verbally filled her in. <laughs> but oops, I accidentally CC'd the district manager, who happens to be C's direct boss. In the meantime, I do as I'm told. I finish up what I can of the planograms for that day, and then on to the next day. C has her grandkids in again. Same old set of directions. I have her send me an email, feigning stupidity, so I can send it to the next shift worker and accidentally CC the district manager again. 
two weeks go by and it happens just one more time. I eventually get a call from an unknown number on a day off and hooray, it's the district manager. Let's call him Dave. And he says, hey, Chippy T, this is Dave calling from our district office. I was getting back to you on this email I was CC'd in a few weeks ago that you sent me. What's this about grandkids and $10? I explain everything to him. And of course, with the emails as proof, there's no deniability. He says if there is anything else that I find to please let him know. And then he tells me that he will forward all of this to head of HR and they will begin the investigation. I'm feeling quite satisfied and continue work as though the phone call never happened and she eventually did stop bringing her grandkids by but not before the investigation was rumored to have started. A month and a half passed by and I put in my two weeks notice because I found a better job and <laughs> I hated it there. She tried to fire me but it didn't work out and I came back the same day that she fired me, story for another day, and I get a call from Dave again and he tells me that they finished their investigation and found her conspiring to break child labor laws or something like that and that she will be removed from her position but also found in their investigation that all five stores in the district got a complete clean out of every level employee in the store because they found many of them were falsifying the rewards points, essentially inputting their own phone numbers instead of the customer ones so they could get more discounts. I, uh, why, this is in malicious compliance, it technically is, but this is, this is pro-revenge through and through, even nuclear, not only cost this lady her entire career that she set up her own trap and took her own bait, you literally got her child labor law violations and took out the whole entire store corrupt employees for using their own point. <laughs> I did not expect any of this when this story first started. I just thought we were in for some nice MC, didn't you? And then, oh my goodness, OP, you are the MVP of the day. Will you check out the Austin Stories podcast so you can listen to these stories in podcast form? I'll put a link in the description, but it's also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Thanks. Some supermarket MC results in a great deal, posted by Galta. So I work at the fish counter at a grocery store, one that's part of a big regional chain. Part of my responsibilities include signing off on deliveries in the morning and then stashing all the fresh fish that I can as rapidly as possible, get them processed, sorted, weighed, and labeled, and out into the fish counter or the prepackaged area. Fish has to be pretty fresh to be safe to sell, so I have a lot of leeway in my duties. Or at least I usually do. The whole meat department, the meat and fish counters, plus the packaging areas, are all under one manager, Doris. She's a, a pretty chill gal <laughs> and runs a pretty good team. When she's not here, the head employee at each counter is in charge of their general area and any customer issues or complaints get escalated to the store manager on duty. Anyway, Doris managed to get approved for an extended vacation and had a relative getting married in Canada or, or something. So she left early last week and won't be back until tomorrow. This isn't a problem. Again, the counters are used to running by themselves on her off days or in the evenings after she goes home, so we can manage a week, no problem. One of the store managers, though, apparently decided that we couldn't possibly manage for a week without some direct leadership. This guy, we'll call him Steve, decided that he needed to hover over us every morning as we worked, making comments on our decisions for how to prep, package, and sell. Uh, fine, whatever, it, it sucks, but we can deal. Friday he was off, so it was smooth as usual. The problem though, is that Friday, some of the mackerel we got in was off. It happens, I mean, I mark it down and just toss it. When Steve came back on Saturday, he was livid. How dare I toss non-expired product on my own volition? I got chewed out and was told that I was expected to process and sell every single fish we received and that a manager would decide if something was too old to sell. Today, I got my first chance to comply. Hey Steve, every single fish packaged and out for sale, right? 
I asked, making sure the rest of the meat staff were in earshot. Just get it done, is the reply. Behold my masterpiece. I hope it's still here tomorrow so Doris and Steve and all the other managers can meet to decide if it's too old to sell. And some idiot bought it, so I guess Steve was right. And the example picture is literally, literally, five cents a tiny snapper sardine style fish in a container to sell. Five cents. That's like a, a penny of a pound. What is this, OP? So the whole idea was that this manager comes in, new hotshot, right? And says, oh, hey, we're going to sell every product. It doesn't matter. We're not letting this affect our numbers. Yeah, everything sells, even the stuff that shouldn't. That's the problem. He says it should. Ah, this guy, this manager kills me, right? But I just want to know one thing. Why did he come in new and hot, thinking he ran the place? He's a male carrot. That's why. Check out my next malicious compliance compilation to continue your listening session by clicking here on your screen. Thank you so much for checking this one out and see you in the next one.